Hi guys, Alan here. Welcome to the workshop. In this video I want to continue the um, lathe tool sharpening jig that I started a prototype in the previous episode. That'll be this guy. And uh, we'll finish it off in this episode. Uh, it's a long one. <laughs> it might be a small project but it actually has a lot of elements and there's a lot of machining. A lot. So in this episode you'll see me uh, using all my big toys. The, the two milling machines, the lathe, the bandsaw, even the hydraulic press gets a cameo. Uh, there's a lot of action. There's also a lot of problem solving because uh, as I've said many times I'm relatively new to this sport so um, uh, with any machining operation there's a lot of planning thinking about the steps and then the fixturing and getting set to do it and for me <laughs> they're all problems to be solved but they're enjoyable problems uh, so there's a lot to do. Anyway I'll kick off this uh, uh, video by boring out the uh, the wheel cylinder to take the stub axle that's got to hold the uh, the tool holder. So better get straight into it. Okay so now I want to uh, uh, clean up the bore of this cylinder and uh, get it hopefully one size all the way through and uh, so I'm going to mount it in the bracket and um, I just want to uh, and the way I've done that is just to use a square and uh, set the face using the square like that and I'm going to check that to see how good or bad it is using the DTI so we'll just do that. And back up again. I think I'll call that good enough for what I'm trying to do. Okay, so we've got the uh, the cylinder set um, vertical in um, fore and aft away from the uh, axis of the camera so now I've got to get it set vertical this way <coughs> excuse me I'm going to start off by doing a rough cut with the uh, digital readout across the top here and then I'll use this uh, funny looking object here which is uh, a dial gauge with a back plunger to run down the inside of the bore it's only long enough to go down oh I don't know two-thirds of the way or something but it should still give me a pretty accurate reading of uh, whether I've got this right or not so we'll start out with the uh, this gauge and uh, we'll zero this in its current position right and stick it on here what's that saying a couple of degrees off so we'll get it right like that to start with I'm not sure whether you can see that, I'll check in a minute. So this digital thing thinks it's right, so it's going to be somewhere close and we'll check with the, the uh, dial gauge now. Okay, so now you can see what's going on here. Um, this uh, ball on the end of the spindle here will push the uh, back plunger in as it goes up and down and uh, give us a bit of a reading. So I'll bring you around the front so you can read the dial gauge with me. Okay, so let's bring the cylinder up and uh, start swiping down the inside of it. So we're fairly close. So this is when it suddenly occurred to me that this method is flawed because it's only relevant if the sides of the cylinder, internal sides of the cylinder, are actually parallel, which they're not. I know that the bore is tapered, so lining it up on one side is just uh, not going to give me what I need to get. Because I can't easily um, set this uh, plumb by uh, indicating off the inside of the bore, it's, it's possible but uh, it's just not worth the effort, I've decided to slip the um, reamer back in, which is quite a good fit in the, for all that this bore is slightly tapered. This is actually a pretty good fit in there, I'm not feeling any slop so I'm going to indicate this now, or I'm going to set this plumb now by indicating off the uh, the side of this this parallel part of the, of the reamer. So to do that I want to <coughs> have the um, uh, indicator uh, mounted in the quill so I can run it up and down, it's just going to be easier. And to do that I need to lock the quill stop it rotating so I'll be using this little 
this little doodad that I made up ages ago. It takes the place of one of the dogs in the end of the quill and there's a little brass um, button that presses against the, uh, the outer surface and stops it all rotating. So I'm going to install that. Okay, so I've got to remove one of these drive dogs. Take this one out. Right. And replace it with um, replace it with this little gizmo. So now, when I do this uh, clamping screw up, you'll be able to see that it. Um, jams up against the um, underside of the, the uh, quill housing. So now this uh, the quill can't rotate and before I forget I'm going to go and turn the power to the machine off so that I can't accidentally turn it on while that locks in place. Okay so I can put the chuck back now to hold the DTI. So uh, see this thing is designed to fit in the cut out there. So I started off um, uh, like that and then it suddenly dawned on me if I had any inaccuracy in the alignment in the other direction the curve would uh, give me incorrect results. So new setup, changed, changed mind, different setup. So switched over to the uh, dial indicator of the back plunger and put a, a wide disc on it um, so it can ride there without getting uh, confused by the change in the radius. I'll put that in there. Okay, let's see what we get. There's obviously a bit of a change in diameter just right up the top there, so we've got to ignore that. Reset ourselves to zero after that point. Right, so let's go from there. Alright, so we can see the top's got to come towards the, the camera a little bit. And we're within a thousandth there, over a reasonable length. I think I'll leave well alone and call that it. So I thought I might as well check it uh, the other way, well I've got the setup uh, and it's easy to do. Hmm, well it's uh, not quite so good is it? So I think we might uh, see if we can improve on that since I can adjust them independently. Alright, how are we looking now? Now, I think I'm going to leave well alone at that. Okay, so I've got the centering indicator set up with the needle sticking down inside the bore. So we'll be able to turn that around and um, get centered. So that's as good as I'm going to get it. I'll just go down a bit further in the bore, see if it makes any difference. All right, so I think we'll use that as our yeah. So we'll use that as our centre position and get set up for doing the boring. Okay, so I don't know whether you'll be able to hear this, but I've touched off with a very light. So that's. It's not touching all the way around at the top here. But when we get a bit further in. So I think we'll take our first cut at that setting and uh, that'll give us a, a baseline to work from.
I'm expecting the cap to get uh, a little bit heavier as it gets towards the bottom so I deliberately put the um, the biggest uh, side upwards and we know that there's a uh, uh, three maybe five thousandths difference top to bottom okay so we'll pull it out and uh, have a look down the hole Looking down the hole is going to be easier said than done too. Might be a job for a mirror I think. Well, it doesn't look too bad, I reckon we've pretty much come out in the middle of the hole at the bottom. Oh, that's encouraging. A little longer than a few minutes later. So we're going to call the boring operation complete. Now I've got the, everything else set up though, this boring head is capable of facing, i.e. traversing across. So I've never used it to do that, or this will be the first time. So I'm going to find out how to do that and then face this, uh, face this top face off. Okay, well, <clears throat> here's my first go at uh, trying to do a facing operation. I've got it set for a very light cut and we'll see how it goes. Seem to work alright. Well, it's worked like a champ. <laughs> Pretty happy with that. Right, well, I think we're done. Um, unless I can think of a way of mounting the cutter um, so it can face the underside. I have a bit of a head scratch, see if I can think of a way of doing that. So I've decided my best option is just simply to loosen this off and turn this guy upside down and set it up again. At least I only have to set it in one, one direction. And this time, because hopefully the sides of the bore are parallel, I'll be able to um, run an indicator down inside. Okay, so I've upended this and set it initially with that digital inclinometer thing digital angle measuring thing and now I've got the um, DTI in there running on that back face now hopefully the, we've got a parallel bore this time so I can do it so we'll drop this down inside the bore and see what happens that's looking pretty good it's about as far as I can go but I'm pretty happy with that that's going to be good enough for me to face that off So I think it's time to take it out of the vise and uh, have a proper inspection. And uh, I think for better or worse, <laughs> this bit's done. Okay, so that turned out pretty well. I think the, you can see a bit of the surface finish there. It's, it's actually really smooth. Uh, it's almost like it's had the, uh, the surface, you know, what do you call them, the little honing stones through there. But anyway, I'm quite pleased with the way it turned out. So I've got a parallel sided bore to a nominal size of 28.9. Okay, now as you can see in this picture, this crappy bracket has got a lot of uh, issues and uh, most of which I didn't care about when we were in prototype mode. So um, one is that the 
bottom here isn't actually flat. You can see there's a, uh, a bigger gap there. It's flat across here, but it's probably bent across this big hole. Anyway, so there's that. And of course the, the elephant in the room is this um, enormous um, out of square condition. Again, for prototyping I didn't care, and uh, for boring the, um, the cylinder I just compensated for it. But um, th <laughs> a little bit more interest in the possibility of using this bracket as actually the thing. So I'm going to have a go at um, um, opening this angle out to more like 90 degrees. And of course the big issue is this uh, great big hole here. It's going to try and bend across there. So what I'm going to do is put a round block in there and squeeze with the hydraulic press and see if I can uh, get it sorted that way. Well, let's go over to the press and see what happens. At the moment it's a bit of scrap so we haven't got much to lose. Okay so we're good to go and I think you can see over on the left hand side the size of the gap and I've got just enough to hook the square onto to monitor that. So let's put a, put a bit of pressure on and see what happens. Start off with five tons and see what that looks like. I think that's moved it a little bit, so we'll go a bit more. Yeah, it's definitely moving it and closing the gap. Now I'll have to go past it, I'm sure, so let's go a bit more. Ooh, that's probably way too much. Let's see where we're at. Oh, actually, that's not bad, is it? Okay, well let's have a proper look. As you can see, that's actually dead flat against the, that, so that was a win. And on the other side here, we're flat all the way across here. And we've just got that little bit there. And I'm sure that's because it's bent across the, bent across the hole here from before I start doing anything. So anyway, regardless of what I choose to do with this thing, that's improved its uh, outlook on life. I have to think about whether or not I try and do anything with this uh, area here. The amount uh, of gap there is probably, might be just as easy just to face it off here and uh, clean it up with a, a milling cut. So I'll give it a bit more thought. But anyway, I got a good result from the, the straightening, well, sorry, the resetting the angle. So to quantify the amount I'd have to uh, face off here to get this flat, this is a one mil thick um, gauge block and it just just starts in there. So that's how I'd have to mill off a, a millimetre. Okay, I've decided I've been pussyfooting around this hole for too long. I'm going to cut the hole out and uh, weld the two bits back together. It'd be easier than trying to fill the hole up. Okay, so I've made a bit of progress. Um, I've cleaned this guy up. Oh, you saw me earlier cut the, uh, that foot off past that big hole. And I realised I didn't need to weld the tab back on. I can just um, fix this. This is a piece of uh, spare I've cleaned up. We'll have a look at that in a tick. Anyway, I can just um, put these uh, screws through that into there. And so um, that's going to look a, a little bit like a bit like that. And uh, that's all I actually need because I remembered from my prototype that this piece here doesn't need to uh, rotate. You might remember the same. It can uh, just sit there. Um, let's put it like that so you can see a bit better. Better just sit there like that 
uh, with these screws coming through stay and uh, yeah that, that should be all, all it needs uh, I cleaned it up as you can see got rid of a lot of the, the sconge and whatever so it looked a bit respectable and I think that's good enough to uh, make it to the, make the final cut I don't think there's any reason to uh, throw that out and try and do something nicer or at least not in my garage <laughs> Uh, now this was a this started out in life actually as a spare wheel bracket on the trailer but anyway I've cleaned it up and um, I'm just going to uh, mount that on the end there cut it to length drill a hole and Bob's your mother's brother this of course still happily fits in there not sure whether that's in focus I'm looking at this so um, we're getting well on the way so really the main piece left to make now is the um, axle stub, whatever you want to call it, to go through there, and then the piece to mount the um, cutters in. So I suppose there's uh, two significant pieces left to do. Better get back to it, haven't I? Okay, so what I'm calling the toe of this bracket, finished up 25 millimeters uh, wide, and so I'm, I want to put my two screws on the center line of that. So I'm going to scribe a line 12.5 up from the, the back side, which I'll use as the reference. So first thing is to zero this guy. Alright. And we'll come up 12.5. Um, somewhere there, so we clamp that ok and um, now I want to show you uh, something which is going to be a bit of an issue um, so I've got to drill through there and tap but what's going to happen as you can see I just uh, scribe a line here I'm trying to keep my hands out the way so you can see what I'm doing You better see that that scribe line is still quite close to the, the radius in the corner of the piece. So if I drill through from the other side, which is what I have to do, I can't reach from this side, drill through from the other side, the drill is going to try to break through where that um, change in thickness is. And that's an absolute recipe for a broken drill. So we've got to do things a bit differently. Um, so let's have a think about some of the options we've got for that. OK, options. So I've got some of these spot faces, um, but I don't have anything that's actually going to work. These are designed to create a clearance hole for a socket head screw to drop through. So you drill a clearance hole for the shaft of the screw, and then this will spot face on top for the diameter of the head. But both uh, oversized in both cases. But um, the problem I've got is I want to tap this thing to be... Um, for an M8 screw, so the um, that 6.8 um, is the tapping drill. So none of these things are going to work. And also these these ones are too short anyway. I do have some that are meant for um, SAE screws, but and they are long enough. But again, they're massively oversized for what I'm trying to do. So I could uh, mill across there and flatten that whole area off, but I'm a bit reluctant to do that because the curve is going to give it um, a stiffness. I don't really want to lose that. Um, another option would be to um, come through from the back with a milling cutter, um, a slot drill like this guy. And uh, I don't have one that's 6.8 millimeters though, but I do have this guy which is 5 millimeters, and that's the right size for an M6 screw. So I think I'm going to change my plans and use two M6 screws um, coming up from underneath. If I had a long enough end mill, which I don't, then obviously I could go that way and uh, do the drill and tap into the, uh, 
the, uh, the, the base piece. But anyway, out of my options, I think this is the best way to go. Uh, an end mill um, slot drill will, will come through that change in thickness without any trouble at all. That's what we'll do. Alright, well there we go with the uh, first 5mm hole. Don't like the way that's wobbling around. So I'll put a big clamp, well a toolmaker's clamp across the back here. Let's see if that helps. Yeah, that seems to be helping. Starting to come through at the bottom now. Should be able to just see that. Take it real slow. It's through. Right, to make it uh, a better chance of getting the holes to line up on the other part when I drill, I'm doing all my marking out from this, this uh, edge here. Coming through. Now I'm going to be really careful with the tapping for the same reason. One done without mishap. And running. broken drills or broken taps, <laughs> happy about that. Okay, so ready to drill the two holes in the base plate. Alright, now we've got to bo open both of those out to six. So they'll be six all the way through and have a counter bore to let the head of the screw in. These um, two point these two-point drills are really good because they're very stiff for their size, so they um, they don't need centering drills. They're almost like stubbies, I suppose. <laughs> Only thing is, as uh, I found earlier on in this same project, you've got to remember they can't drill deep holes. Let's finish with a six-mil drill. We should be able to do a test fit at this point, just to make sure that. Um, things actually line up. So I've just put a couple of long screws in this to make sure I've got some um, bolts sticking out the bottom. Yeah, that's pretty good. Happy with that. Seems to line up on the corner. So uh, all I've got to do now is counterbore these to uh, leave room for the um, socket head, the cap screw, the head. Okay well I've got a counterbore set in there that's, uh, this one's this one's actually meant for um, five millimeter bolts, but um, I find the the, the standard uh, counterbore is way oversized for my preference, and also the the, the guide bush on the end. Uh, anyway, so this will do um, a counterbore of about 10.1 millimeters, which would be just right to hold the the head of a six mil bolt. So I'm going to go down six millimeters. Six point five, which should be ample. So I haven't settled on my final screw yet, but it'll be something like that. Okay, so that's perfect. That was six point five deep. Six point five. All 
Right, I've got a bit of a burr around the top of the hole there, so I've got to deal with that. Uh, but otherwise, it's good for a test fit, I think. Okay, well, let's do the test. Well, that's turned out right. Okay, so it's time to make the uh, the short axle or stub axle or slug or whatever you want to call it <laughs> to go in here. And it needs to be uh, a little bit under 29 millimeters diameter. And the material I'm going to use is this piece of um, two inch diameter round bar. It was laying out in the grass somewhere for years and got all rusty, but uh, actually I don't know what sort of material it is, but it does machine quite nicely. So that's what we'll be using. Put in, it's got a, has a slight bend in it, but uh, I took that most of that out with a hydraulic press and what's left isn't enough to get excited about. And especially with working with short bits like I will be here. So, let's get started. Okay, we're roughing this down to size. Uh, currently on 36.8, so got a bit to go to get down, a bit to go yet to get down to 29. <clears throat> I've been taking um, um, uh, 0.5 millimeter cuts. Okay, well that's just the sort of fit I was looking for there. Yeah, so I'll call that it for the parting off. I'll just whip it off with a hacksaw from there. I don't want that thing bouncing around. Be a little bit lighter now, shouldn't it? Ooh, still pretty heavy though. Oh. So 
I'm going to put this piece back in here so we can close him off. So, how's that bit done? Okay, well that's another piece of the puzzle well on the way. So I've made up the um, axle stub thing. That's a pretty firm fit in there, which is what I'm wanting. I've made up this piece. It is a, a keeper plate with a little, uh, little uh, groove on that, or a little rebate on the back. So it centers in there. And I'll do those up. So obviously I can just loosen them up. They've got to be quite loose to allow any movement. Quite loose. <laughs> So I'll be able to get the angle I want there <clears throat> and then lock it in place without disturbing it and that's going to hold it without any trouble at all. Um, the <clears throat> and I haven't decided on the final shape of this front piece yet. Um, clearly it's thick enough to uh, be drilled and tapped so I can mount the L-shaped piece on here so I can have uh, tools in either that direction or at 90 degrees. <clears throat> so I guess that's the next bit to do, is to, to make that thing and clarify to myself exactly how I'm going to attach them. Um, I might make this a rectangular shape, I might put a groove across there, I don't know, I'll think about that tonight, and then uh, decide which way I want to go. Okay, so time to make the L-shaped piece. Um, now I've got several options here, I want to have a, a piece of steel, or I want to use a piece that's 25 thick, so that I get um, six each side of my 13mm slot and um, oh, it needs to be at least 20 deep so and the nominal size I'm looking for is 20, 20 by 25 basically so I've got a couple of options I can cut it out of this piece of steel plate which I bought as scrapped or oh, I don't know 30 plus years ago I had dreams of building my own hydraulic press but never did and that's why I bought this big chunk of one inch plate now I could torch cut it out of that but then of course there'd be a big clean up and uh, I'm not real keen on that um, for something that's supposed to be a bit precise but I could do it but I've got another option which I think I'll try first because it's a lot less work and um, doesn't involve flame cutting uh, and that's to use this piece of 25 by 20 bar I think if I basically um, well I can cut it in half but uh, the L that I want needs to be about 75 by 75 so I cut 75 off and I think I'll just um, uh, basically butt weld them together with a proper V preparation because there, there really isn't going to be any particular strain at this point so why not if it works it's a lot easier than larking around with a flame cut and clean up so that's what I'm going to do Okay, so we're going to clean that up a little bit. So let's clean the two 25mm wide faces up. Now we'll do the, uh, the narrower 20mm edges, shall we call them. Okay, so that's got that cleaned up on all four faces. Um, so I'm ready to cut a couple of pieces to length now to weld together to make the L.
Okay, so we'll start off by uh, just cleaning the ends of these two bits up. Let's clean that up. So, time to turn it up and do the uh, 45 degree ends. Now, I expect you can see um, the bandsaw didn't do a fantastic job cutting that angle, but it isn't going to matter. So to get, my 40, to get my 45 degrees, I'm going to sit the piece in this little, uh, what, you, what do you call it, really a square, so anyway. Um, so I'll put that in, into the vise, sit that in there, and it uh, should be a pretty quick and easy way of getting 45 degrees. And we give that a start with that. Exact length isn't important here, I'm just shooting for about uh, 75, so that's going to be pretty close I reckon. I'll just clean those burrs off while it's in the vise. And now the other one. So I've just realised while I've got it set up in the vise here, I should uh, do the 45 degrees from, uh, chamfering here for the weld prep. Right, well it's created a nice big V, or oh, half of a big V, so I'll do the other half. Okay, so what I've got to do now is weld these two guys together. Looks simple enough, doesn't it, but my welding skills, uh, yeah, well, I'm not sure skill's the right word. But anyway, um, it shouldn't be too hard to stick them together, should it? And uh, they've certainly worked out so far, at least a, a good 90 degrees. None of this is particularly critical, by the way. It doesn't matter exactly how long these things are. It doesn't even matter if they're exactly at 90 degrees or not, because it won't affect um, how I'm going to use the thing. Uh, I don't think it will anyway. But obviously I'll try for 90, and we'll see what we get. So it's a bit late in the day now, so uh, have a go at the welding tomorrow. Okay, well this welding turned out better than some of my efforts, so I'm quite actually happy with that. That's just straight off the welder untouched. So I reckon that will clean up alright. And also, this little bonus, it actually turned out to uh, hold its square etude, so I'm happy about that as well. So now I've just got to work out exactly how I'm going to fix that to that, and then uh, do the grooves for the holding the tools. So I've given a big clean up before I start cutting those uh, grooves. And I was quite pleased with uh, the way that's turned out. I'm sure a professional would have done a much better job but for me that's, that's about as good as my welding ever gets so quite happy with that. Okay so I've decided to use the horizontal mill for cutting those uh, rebates in the L-shaped piece so I'm going to have to move this uh, rotary table out of the way. The first thing I'm going to do, and I'll use my um, uh, lifting arm, which uh, I created for exactly this purpose. And uh, first thing I'm going to do is slip a rubber mat underneath it. Uh, so someone's suggestion to make sure I can't accidentally damage the table. So I think that's a very good idea. So we'll pick this up and stick it on the other milling machine, get it out of the way temporarily. Head south with you. Put the mat ready for the landing. All right, 
Let's get this baby landed. Take the weight with this so we can lower it closer to the table and we let it down gently. And that's how that works and it works very well. So now I'm going to get the uh, horizontal mill set up. Okay so I had the vice off this machine when I was making the index wheel for my dividing head and so putting it back on the first thing I have to do is uh, make sure it's true. So this dial gauge here will track the fixed jaw and to make sure it's parallel to the face of the um, oh, you can see at the back here anyway to make sure it runs parallel to the machine so I think I've got it pretty right takes a little bit of dicking around but it's not that bad really so we'll call that good and move on to the next bit okay so I'm getting ready to um, cut the uh, half inch wide uh, slot or rebate in this piece let's have a quick squeeze at the setup so uh, oh, it's not so easy to see but uh, it's easier from the other side this um, clamp here is to make sure the the cutter can't pick this up and rip it out of the vise so uh, the toe is holding down on, on that. I don't need to hold this down because it, it'll be trying to pick it up from the from that end. Uh, but anyway, that should be enough to make sure that um, the uh, the wheel can't rip it out of the vise. I don't know how much force is involved, but I dare say it'll be quite a bit. Uh, and I don't want to see that come out. <laughs> so I'll be taking um, uh, an eighth of an inch depth of cut. So what's that? three millimetre depth of cut, something like that. We'll see how that goes. Okay, off we go. So that's the first pass at an eighth. So now we come up to, a, a, or yeah, lift it up to a quarter. Should be another an eighth, of, another eighth of inch depth of cut. Right, so now it's time to clear this lot up and turn it around. Certainly sling some chips on it. <laughs> Get rid of these. Just make sure it's going to miss the cutter. Closer than that, a bit more contact. So that's time to come up. Let's try coming up. I'll give it a try coming up at 0.25, I think. I think it was working better when I took the much deeper depth of cut and I was going through at a quarter inch um, per pass. Once it got past the uh, having the teeth fully engaged, it was doing better, I think. Anyway, clean up time. Okay, well that turned out pretty good. It's a bit of half inch tall steel. And uh, happily fits in there. So, 
um, next step belt there onto there okay so I'm going to drill a couple of holes in the top face of this I'm going to start off by making sure I got it correctly aligned in the vise It's looking pretty good. I don't think I need to try and do any better than that. So let's get into setting up. For, oh, so now I've got to find this thing. So I'll get the um, the um, nickel the blooming thing, the circle-y thing. <laughs> I can't forget what it is. Something indicator. Okay. Well, I've got the uh, circle-y thing, otherwise known as the centering indicator, installed. So the way this works, so I'm sure you've seen it before. I get a reading here. I'm going to set this on zero. So zero in the front face, go around to the back, and uh, wind it back about halfway. Right, we come around to the front again. We're somewhere near it. Now do the same on the, the other direction. So we're there. All right, come back halfway towards it. Probably getting in the ballpark now. Right. So we'll get it going. It's getting worse. Much worse. Somewhere there. Much worse. Right now we're getting there. And I think that'll be close enough for what I'm trying to do. Okay, so now we want holes for a pair of M5 screws um, in here. I'm going to go with, uh, as I said, M5 screws, so it's um, a 4.2mm hole. And I want them offset 18.7 from, from the centre on the centre line. So we'll just move over 18.7. And then 18.7 on the other side. Open both of these holes out to 4.2. I think we'll start off power tapping these until the tap slips in the chuck. About now, but look at it. Finally that noise next door has stopped briefly. These holes functionally didn't need to go all the way through but uh, there were two reasons why I did do it that way. First is I hate blind holes, they're uh, much more difficult to uh, to tap and so on. And the second thing is my uh, I managed to break my uh, bottoming tap just recently and the new one is held up somewhere in La La Land. Uh, so it was better just to run all the way through. Okay, so I'll just uh, touch these with a countersink. So then it's time to uh, repeat that whole pattern in the other piece. Okay, so we're centred across the width and the 14 in from the end, which is where I want to be. First hole. cutting terribly well. Now the drill didn't feel like it was cutting terribly well. And check him out. Okay, so now I've got to uh, cut the countersink for these uh, heads of these screws. I 
Um, I'll use this little countersink because the head size is just slightly bigger than the head of the screw so I can just work it into the material until the head disappears down the hole. below the surface that's perfect in fact so I know I've got to get that out again <laughs> all right then let's see if this lot lines up that's looking encouraging that's one in a line come on here So all I have left to do now is uh, set the correct length for this uh, base piece and drill a hole in it, cut off the spare and uh, oh, I might throw some paint on it, I might not. Anyway, it'll be ready to ready to use. So. Oh, <laughs> goose, <laughs> of course I've got to drill the holes here for the clamping screws, forgot about that. Okay, so the beast has got uh, clamping screws. I've hacked off the base plate to roughly the right length and put a hole in it. But the uh, clamping screws are certainly going to get the job done. And uh, I've set it up so it should be able to hold short pieces as well. So it'll give me a bit of versatility. So obviously we've still got the functions that was originally was the basis for the whole thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, but it just it dawned on me a little while ago that um, I shot myself in the foot with one thing. I was expecting to put my digital angle measuring thing standing on the top there. Well, obviously all these screws will get in the way of that. So I think what I'll be doing is um, leaving the screws out of it and uh, just putting in whatever it is I need. Um, for the thing that's to be sharpened, then I can still use the the angle finder. Anyway, let's go kind of a quick look at it standing on the machine. So I've just done a couple of quick setups here using the existing um, uh, cutter. I just put it in and satisfied myself that it's possible to uh, um, uh, match the, uh, the 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 angles that are already on this. Um, cutting thing so I figured if I can match that that's a good start so that's that one we come out the other side and I think you can see that it's going to be quite easy to uh, get to the correct position for this one as well now we've got to tip him down a bit Probably rotate a bit as well. So let's match that angle. And uh, so I can uh, sharpen it like that. So uh, that's as far as I'm going to go in this video. I want to get some uh, proper practice in using it and maybe slap some paint on it. Um, but yeah, so we'll end this one here. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, perhaps you hit the like button. Maybe subscribe if you haven't already. And hit the bell so that you get told when uh, more comes up. Anyway, thanks again for watching and I'll catch you on the next one.